So formerly we used to have reporting on crisis and catastrophes by journalists, but since everyone is having a smartphone, everyone can take videos or pictures, and what does that mean actually for perception for everyone else around the world? And what kind of conflicts will arise for helping institutions on the grounds? So Ruben Neugebauer and Sebastian Junemann from kdos.ev are going to um, talk about them. So enjoy this talk. Yes. Good morning, everyone. So good to see so many faces already. It's always hard when there's when you have an early slot. I would like to start that there's with saying that there's three of us. We're going to have a live um, connection to Faye Baumann um, from the Kurdish Red Half Moon. She is currently in northeast Syria, where our projects are located. We hope that this. Um, this uh, live connection will work and that she can give us some impressions directly from the ground. Just uh, from the beginning, Kados itself as a humanitarian organization is uh, and has to be religious and politically independent. Um, but we as humans are clearly not. We have, we, we understand and we define ourselves as left. And um, so when we talk about this uh, offensive um, by the Turkish, um, we do not claim to do this in an academic neutral way, but actually in a political way. And we do want to say that up front and have this as a disclaimer. So a little bit about us and what we're doing. And um, the, the other organization they're working with, it's a helping organization, kind of like ASB, um, which is the um, Arbeiter Samariterbund. Um, they do um, saving uh, missions, um, but they're also involved in rehabilitation, in psychological welfare and care. It's a very, very large organization by now. Over the past five years, we've grown quite a lot. We have partnerships with them a lot and on a continuous basis. Currently at the moment, there's a, us, we're like a smaller organization in Berlin. We are kind of like have this crisis response makerspace. Some of your faces I've seen around. We're trying to work on a diverse set of problems that we have in the humanitarian market. More this kind of classical kind of maker thing. But we're also doing field work and we've been doing it for five years, mainly in Northeast Syria. We always also were in Iraq. I uh, did a short trip to um, see Saviour and in northeast Syria, this, but this is where we mainly do our work. So since 2014, we've done uh, work in that region. As a disclaimer up front also, um, Rojava was part in of the the head like the the title of the talk, and this is quite difficult. It's it's this to use this term because the structures on the ground um, currently um, they would like to refer to this as northeast Syria as it is self-governed, and we're trying to do that. But because the term Rojava has been used in the media so much, that's why we're using it. But we do want to want to mention this in the beginning. All right, so um, crisis and communication. It's there's lots of stuff that you can follow live. There's like rockets that are being too shot to the mass and we can see them coming back to the ground. You can see the PR department of the German train company. Um, you can uh, live stream uh, German uh, folk artists. You can also uh, follow crises and conflicts life. And for a long time we've asked ourselves what does that actually mean for organizations on the ground. It's great if you have that many information and but it's a different thing when when you don't just want to inform yourself but you also want to work as an organization on the ground and you want to make decisions and you have to make decisions about where can I help, where am I maybe potentially also in danger, that sort of stuff that sort of information. What does this mean for organizations on the ground? We're kind of in the post-factual era, in the era of Twitter diplomacy, and today was are not just, they mean they're, they're, they're followed by social media, and they're also being kind of fought on social media to a certain extent. So the sources and diversity in sources in all of social media 
it is on the one hand that we have so much more information that we used to have. Mainly we also have it so much quicker, but on the other hand, this also means it becomes a lot more difficult to evaluate this information because disinformation and gossip and that sort of and, and misinformation spreads just as fast. So for a long time, we kind of wanted to talk about what does that actually mean for us on the ground, this kind of changed media landscape. And we have one good example uh, on the ground for this. Yeah. So why is Northeast Syria such a good example? Well, it, it isn't a classical conflict in a sense. It's a civil war within Syria with multiple different players, with militia, with a state regime that internationally has been um, quite questionable. And what does propaganda, um, This it's kind of like a play, like a proxy war and um, there is accompanying this there is this this conflict between the Turkish and the Kurdish um, and all of that is merged in this region and in the past five years this was always quite highly dynamic um, also for us because also inside Kurd inside the Kurdish community there's quite a large amount of conflict um, so there's there's a lot of stuff that comes together in a conflict region that usually don't come doesn't come up, but in this case it's kind of interesting to look at. But even in the five past five years, it was always quite dynamic, and even though the clown in the White House has been in office for quite some time, but over the past few months, the dynamic of the conflict has gotten so much more extreme that we really really cannot rely on anything anymore. Erdogan for a long time has been threatening and want, wanting to do some things, claiming he'd start an offensive. But there was always some sort of level of stability that you could count on, basically also because of this kind of status of a proxy war. But like reading this tweet, I was really like, did he get hacked or was did he has gone completely off the rocks? And that's why today we want to focus on how to handle sources and source identification and how to rely on sources. And how, how can I like respond to them when I'm on the ground? We want to start with giving a short overview of how, what, what actually took place when the invasion happened. Um, in order to do that, we want to um, get Fee to be um, also here with us. Do I have to do something? Are you guys doing it? Oh. Hello, Fee. Hi, Fee. Maybe really quickly, Fee. Fee works for the Kurdish Red Half Moon. She does not like to introduce herself, but she does an, am an amazing, outstanding job. She coordinates lots of different projects, and she has a much better insight than us who are there a lot, but do not have the same expertise that she does. Fee, maybe your part. Fee, wait a second, we don't have sound yet. Still no sound from the video. Hello? Oh. <laughs> okay, so the sound is somewhat. So unfortunately, the sound uh, from the video into the booth is really bad. Okay, so she's talking about how she cannot Sorry guys, um, it's really hard because we're not getting a direct audio stream from uh, what's going on on the video um, so unfortunately, um, we simply cannot translate this at this time. Bear with us, we're going to be back with you when the people on stage are back to talking and hopefully they're going to give a bit of a summary of what we just heard, um, slash we didn't hear, unfortunately. So sorry. Um, 
die syrische Regierung diese Camps nicht akzeptiert, diese neuen Camps. Das heißt, UN-Organisationen können und dürfen uns offiziell nicht unterstützen. Ähm, zusätzlich finden natürlich immer noch weiterhin Kämpfe äh, statt. Okay, so additionally there are still wars going on. I'm getting a better tune now. At the moment, there is not as many civilians involved and being affected by it. That's great, but um, currently this is limited to military um, actors. Additionally, it is, however, the case that the state of security has worsened all over the region. There's ISIS cells that are trying to destabilize this region even further as best as they can, and these cells since the attacks um, by the Turkish government um, have have grown, there is th there's a lot more attacks going on everywhere now. Additionally, it is the case that the region that was that is now being taken over and occupied by the Turkish. It is assumed that it's forbidden that Kurdish is not being allowed to be spoken on the streets anymore. All public uh, official buildings have been renamed. There's no more Kurdish language being used, only Turkish or Arabic. And it is quite clear that it's similar like Afrin. It's completely forbidden that Turkish is being spoken on the streets. Uh, Kurdish, I'm sorry, guys. Um, the medical supply in, on the ground, even before the the offensive, eight years of civil war, it was it was quite dire, and and um, taking care of refugees in the older camps, it was miserable. It was horrible. It was quite critical. Now, with 300,000 more refugees, it has become even more extreme, and it's much more critical than it was before. Additionally, it's winter now, so that means that it is there's there's a lot of people catching um, diseases, like getting sick. It's much colder. People are being put up in tents. It's the rainy season. We have a lot of newborns and pregnant women who are in much danger, obviously. We have um, a lot of... I mean, this is a high-stress environment, which leads to a lot of um, psychological problems, clearly. And what we can basically not stabilize like it's it's really hard to to supply that kind of um, care so the environment basically everything here has like everybody here has lost everything and like and they can't go back drinking water and enough food is <laughs> quite, uh, quite not good. Like it, there's just too little for everyone. And on top of that, one of the main water pipes has been damaged by an airstrike from Turkey and is now a part of the Turkish sector. is still broken, so that means that. About 700,000, probably more, are without water or with in without enough water. At the moment, we're carrying in the water in, in big trucks. But, but 
the quality of that water is obviously a lot worse. We have the problem that currently it's a little bit, it's quite stable that humanitarian goods are being shipped in and being waved through, but we're always depending on the goodwill of, for example, the Iraqi border patrols. And we cannot rely on, on humanitarian goods uh, coming in on time. And we cannot always pass it on on time on the ground to other regions because the streets are still quite insecure and unsafe. Also the distribution to public uh, hospitals and medical equipment is also very bad and it's, bec it's becoming worse, it's been becoming worse. Also, of course, because of the war or because of the attack from Turkey, there's a lot of highly injured people who are, which, which will have long-term long uh, consequences and we can't take care of them properly right now. So we need prosthesis, physiotherapy and so on. Also like psychological help and right now we cannot do that at all. There is support by international NGOs. The problem here is that many of those, because of the security situation and that it, because it has been so insecure, let's say it's ha completely impossible or almost completely impossible to r risk to risk it so, 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 so to prepare everything on the ground and that makes it that support is arriving more slowly and not in enough um, quantity. Regarding the international community, there's nothing, I'd say. There, there are tiny, tiny projects, but that's all inofficial and and very careful I would I would say so they don't get in political quandaries I guess so this was a little bit of an overview of how the situation is here in addition we have a lot of insecurities in the public and also with NGOs, of course, because so many actors here are suddenly active in this region. And this means that we, we have Turkey, we have the Allies, we have the US, who mainly take care of their oil fields. and Russia and Syria who who are moving around here and same as Turkey are completely impossible to predict so you never know what is happening what's gonna happen and w what you can rely on there have been multiple incidents and accidents with uh, Russian tanks and civil civilians at least five civilians have been killed, have died in those situations, if not more. And all in all, the populace, or in the populace, there's a, a huge insecurity and stress and fear. That was my overview. Yeah, we're going to have a few images before we go on. Thank you, Fee, for this input.
So let's switch. Fee hopefully will stay in the loop. And then we can loop back to a few questions. We have a few images here. We just want to flip through them. We thought about, we thought to use those when we, when the connection to Fee wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible. So these are the images we wanted to show in this case. This is how it looks on the ground there. We heard from Fee that how complex the situation is and what you have to keep in mind and how many actors and it is very hard to find out what is really happening on the ground. So if we have been talking about po the post-fact uh, Era. We don't talk. We don't. We don't only talk about fake news. Those are possible. Uh, those are happening as well. But we're not talking about things that are completely untrue. But if we talk about how um, hard it is to evaluate sources, we also are talking about um, sources where di they didn't intend to um, mislead. So we have a few um, uh, difficulties here. So it used to be uh, there, there has be, there used to be like in the media just in TV TV reports, but. These days it has moved to other sources in social media and on the one hand this is awesome because we get the information very fast and partially we get information that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise and this is, gives us way more options to verify things when they happen but on the other hand it is hard because it gets h way harder to properly analyze everything because misinformation also moves very quickly and another effect is that the classic media um, are reducing their network of correspondence because they can't afford to have people informed correspondence everywhere on the ground and so as they could have they could have done the thing like to just Skype in an informed person like Fee but many media don't do this instead they do they send a moderator from Germany for they send them there for a few days, and for us, this also this also part of this post-fact uh, landscape where media that are not present in the region just fly there for a few days and then talk about the difficult hygiene situation in this in this camp, in the camp Al Hol. Al Hol is a camp which is very hard. There's many thousand people that belong to the IS, so it's a very tense situation. And actually, it is hard. That it, it, it's, there's, there's probably hard uh, hygienic situation, but the reporter doesn't have access to this to these situations and this information. So he just takes whatever is hopping in front of his camera, camera and talks about the difficult hygienic situations to, because because of this little um, water spout here. That's just like it would like we would see in a European camping site. So the situation is we have, we have reports, but it's very hard to see <coughs> are they uh, exaggerating a situation or is it actually that bad? And the whole thing is gonna is, is presented as by by his colleagues even as quality TV and like it enters the public consciousness consciousness under this label so this is a classic problem that we have now talking about post fact society if we have a map that shows the international relations of states uh, in relation to the Turkish invasion of Rojava so green are the countries who who support this uh, attack so then there have been a few countries who were neutral but many countries who were who who said something were said that this would be against international laws and talked about sanctions but still pro war hashtags were way were happening were seen way more than anti war hashtags and especially in turkey pro war hashtags were absolutely way longer in the in the hot topics so we're not talking about click farms and how this might happen today but this information presents itself and you can look at these hashtags and they m don't have a lot of lot to do with reality but another thing that's post fact is that when the command of the militia that is like that is uh, controlled by turkey turkey is when these people um, is asking their militia to not use the social media anime and anymore to c record things from the front and to show that so to prevent the the security security incidents from being spread 
and they they're saying okay this is dangerous for the soldiers but uh, in instead is that they, these images are showing so many violations of international laws and war crimes like this for example here is it about the murder of a Kurdish human rights activist Hadri Kalaf and it was very clear that or it was relatively clear that this was an attack she was being dragged from the car and then shot and this is going went through the media <coughs> not through the media because the person was relatively unknown but if you think about it, if you're interested in this then every day you would see images like this where the militia attacked or went into this region and just posted their crimes to Twitter and of course they didn't uh, they didn't uh, follow this order and continued uploading images and videos from their battles so it's interesting about to talk about post fact so in the, in the internet you find so many images of the awesome German tanks that are being used in the Syrian front but on the same on the uh, at the same, ti same time the German government is saying we don't have sources for this we don't know what's happening there and if you look at this neutrally then we're thinking what what do what sources do we have <coughs> then we think about what sources are being seen so if the government is saying we don't have our own sources <coughs> then they might have sh they should have said like we don't want to have sources because if you think about what the german government has on re has re in resources like to to verify such a video and what are the technical probabilities then it's a bit sad that there's no uh, individual thing. So we know since Chemnitz that the German um, that the German secret services are very bad at uh, verifying videos. Um, but of course, there's very many sources you can use to inform yourself. There's normal um, news channels, and they, ha they have the advantage that they are at least a little bit have a have, have a um, editorial so they filter a little bit what is real what is not real but on the other hand they're, they're certainly a bit slower and then there's <laughs> agencies on the ground that uh, talk about this they look at these things and then have news uh, especially about these regions uh, so these are good channels but there's also the classic social media like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and so on. And in this case it's also super interest Telegram has been playing an important part. I don't want to talk about like how, how good or bad Telegram is, but many of the militia have been using Telegram and uh, and Telegram channels to communicate with their followers. And so here it is you have to do try, try to find a way into that but these militias they sometimes have on their other channels they link to their telegram channels so this was very exciting you have to look like what are the sources right now that work and are the fastest so you find that you not only find the classical sources another um, hurdle that we had was that this is a conflict where so many different languages are being spoken so if I'm looking at the social media then it might be that there's people who talk in Turkish and these talk about, talk about different information than the information that is av available in English or Arabic so it's very very important to have in the back of your head there's many different languages that are, that are relevant and in this conflict are the, it's, it's the language of the conflict parties so English, Turkish, Arabic, Kurdish then a lot of English and also in German because there's a, a huge diaspora to Germany from this region. Right. <laughs> so it's not just languages but also this concept of echo chambers that separates people and filter bubbles and you know we're not quite sure like how close off are these filter bubbles but with these echo chambers I think it's quite clear that if I'm only interested in a certain a certain information then I'm not going to look into other aspects. And uh, there's been lots of talks on this topic and 
another example is this hashtag, uh, this uh, pro-war hashtag. And uh, here's something, I don't know if you've seen this. So this echo chamber concept, um, a soccer player uh, of St. Pauli, a leftist uh, soccer club of Germany, um, he shared and said, we're, we're uh, standing on the same side as our heroes and our army. And so even uh, our prayers are with you. And so a person living and working in a completely separate environment that's pro-Kurdish and anti-war, but still he didn't get the relevant information or, well, Oh, and by the way, at St. Pauli, uh, they fired them. They kicked them off the team, so that's great. So this example really raised the question, so did, did he not know? Can he, uh, can he do this because his whole environment, his surroundings are pro-war? And so, yeah, the question is, what, what information do people even read? What reaches people? And so here we looked at our ambulances. Um, so we've, after the attacks, we've supported ambulances. And so we shared that on Twitter. And you see that here. And most of the time, we try not to work with images because we care about image rights. And uh, we don't want to, you know, like um, shock people. Um, but the same the same message, you know, using shocking imagery um, gets a lot more uh, views. And so also us as a source, we have to think about how we spread information and how we work with that. All right. So uh, once more, we'd like to um, talk to Faye again, because one of our ambulances has been attacked as well. Um, we weren't the first medical institution that was attacked in this war. Um, of course, you know, medical institutions uh, in wartime are um, protected by international law, uh, by the Geneva Convention and such. Um, but uh, this really just been this process of normalization. So without any response from the media, these attacks um, have passed and we've done a press release um, talked about you know like international press uh, international relief organization being attacked but really we didn't get a lot of response to that so Faye um, how's the situation there for you um, you've you've lived through this and so what have the reactions been what have you seen yeah so what happened was um, we had an attack on a trauma stabilization point uh, near Basalain, so um, outside the security zone. Um, and ambulances uh, were damaged, but no workers, luckily. Um, then we had medical teams from the self-administration were kidnapped and executed. And what Seb just mentioned, the uh, jointly run ambulances were attacked under fire. And we had the situation in Rasalain that we still had teams in the city working in the hospital um, that kept on working there and uh, treating people who were injured badly and we didn't have any chance to evacuate those people. So um, medical personnel and um, uh, patients were locked in the city for three days. And so we talked to m most nations that are involved and asked about help uh, to establish a humanitarian security 
uh, convoy. Um, but nothing happened. And in the end, um, we just rode into the city with 30 ambulances and got our teams and those um, heavily injured patients out of the hospital. And uh, this worked. Um, but of course, this was really dangerous because it was clear that us as a humanitarian relief organization aren't recognized as such and uh, could have been attacked during this evacuation. So we try to really get the word out on all possible channels, all available channels on social media, but also through interviews. Um, but again, the uh, reaction was nil. So I, um, at least none that I know of. Uh, and so the situation was devastating in the city, but no one intervened. Um, and I think as long as the Geneva Convention isn't respected um, from military actors, from states even, yeah, I think uh, ambulances and humanitarian aid organizations aren't just aren't going to be safe. Uh, the Geneva Convention states that it's forbidden to uh, shoot at ambulances or humanitarian aid institutions. But uh, yeah, in our case, uh, this rule wasn't followed. And as long as whoever doesn't follow this rule uh, s to provide humanitarian aid safely uh, just isn't possible. Yeah, so in the background we've seen some pictures of these attacks on um, yeah, medical institutions. Um, yeah, we need to keep a look on the time. And so we're going to talk about um, how to interpret sources on the ground, how we do that. So we have international teams on the ground and what problems we have with uh, every person being a possible source on social media. And so one thing I think of is uh, uh, frontline developments. So um, as we've seen, um, we've conquered the city. This message was spread very quickly. But then uh, Kur Kurdish forces said, no, 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 the city hasn't been taken over. And so for us, this raises the question, how how can we trust the source? How, where are the front lines? Where are the fights being fought if we have ambulances going into the city? And back then in Mosul, it was the same. Uh, IS said, oh, we've, you know, conquered some uh, city blocks and this could be fake news. And, uh, you know, in a calm environment in Germany, I could really evaluate this. But if I'm on the ground, then it's really hard. And so... Uh, even, you know, if it's fake or not, could uh, decide over life and death. And so, yeah, these uh, in northern Syria, there's so many actors right now. Um, fun fact, two days ago, Russian and uh, U.S. forces had a fight over there. And it's really a melting pot. It's so important for a lot of people to know where can I go safely? Where is it safe? And so these checkpoints usually have been um, pretty easy to spot, but now these militias go through these checkpoints and um, fly their flag. And so afterwards, we don't even know if they're still there. And so it really takes a long time to decide whether piece of information is true or false. So for example here we have a few flags of the uh, Syrian army. Um, 
but then they drove away again and so it looks like they're there but they're not anymore and then we have this highway m4 sort of this lifeline of the region and it's the same deal here so turkish backed militias saying we've taken over this highway and then they have this photo to verify this claim um, and then we have Kurdish forces uh, saying a little while after, no, they, they haven't taken this highway. And so, you know, uh, me on the ground or as somebody driving an ambulance, you know, now I would have to say, even though this is usually a pretty secure highway, I can't go there right now because I just can't be sure. And so I need to take a detour where there might be traps, where there might be bombs, where there might be attacks. And so this sort of freedom of information, which we're also happy about, can really uh, become a huge problem. And so Fee had this um, had a good example for that. Fee, you're still here? Yes. Um, so an example from Kamishno. Um, uh, please uh, talk about uh, how that was. How that was for you. So yeah, so I uh, myself don't use social media um, at all, but it was quite disturbing. I was in Kamishluk when the attack started. And in the the attack started in the northwestern part. Uh, I knew that, but then I received messages from friends that saw on social media that uh, drones were attacking or airstrikes were occurring uh, near our location. And then I looked outside the window and uh, listened and there was nothing happening. And so I've, I talked to my colleagues on the ground and I've asked them, have there been any attacks here whatsoever? And they said no. And so, uh, all this information came in um, in the morning and then in the evening the attacks have occurred but at the time when I got the information there haven't been any attacks yet yeah, and so this raises the question of uh, how we deal with online sources how can we um, create a report, how can we verify or falsify this information? So we still have people on the ground and, and we have this privilege where we can make a decision of whether or not we go. A lot of people do not, can, especially locals obviously do not have that choice. Um, our question is usually can we go and if so how? And we obviously do not rely on ourselves but also other networks. There's um, there's. INSO is like this international security organization. They are located with a lot of employees. And what they do is like, we're going to explain what we do in, in, in like our short team as well. They do like source analysis. They are reachable. They, can, they, they will evaluate sources. This is a source that's not available to locals, but this is only available to humanitarian international aid organizations. There's obviously a free market. Um, you can obviously understand the sum that you have to um, pay to get that sort of information. We, like us, we have this, we obviously could not just rely on a network doing that for us, so we have our own little version of this. So this is us in Berlin. 24-7 um, we are monitoring the situation on the ground. So we got a lot of matter donated, thanks so much to the audience. And um, so online what we're doing is, is um, monitoring all the different reports, uh, monitoring the Twitter accounts that are reporting. Uh, we're using obviously other home pages that are out there. And additionally to that, we um, 
try to to the professional information gather we try to get our own version of this and uh, supply that to the people on the ground all right so basically what the way that we do this is on the one hand we have open source intelligence so the stuff that we get from the internet the other thing is that like you have like obviously like um knowledge like professional knowledge of this area and then we have um contacts on the ground and, and in order to actually evaluate a situation you need all three of these so we have this tank video for example um, our expertise tells us that this is a leopard tank. Um, we can identify that quite quickly. We're not like weapon nerdies, but we can like identify things obviously based on our previous work and it's good in it. And we obviously understand the logo up on the left corner quite easily and um, based upon that you can usually reconstruct the location. There's multiple different ways of doing this. You can triangulate this, but you can also try to ask locals if they can identify buildings that are showing up in the videos um, in order to identify where stuff happens. Um, if you do reverse image search um, and put it into Google, it also is usually quite helpful. Like I do that a lot. Um, I a lot of time find fakes based on that because you can like take pictures that like pictures from somewhere else were taken in order to dra dramatize something else and you're actually seeing something from the Lebanon war 30 years ago um, so with this method I can quite quickly verify a large amount so based on this tank I knew that they were being used on the ground but then obviously you also have to know your own limitations of things that you cannot say um, you're a lot of times very tempted to make assumptions. Um, I'll get to that later on. Um, that you really have to think about what do we know and what do we really not know. And ideally, we try to um, do this based on these three pillars. Obviously, like our expertise and context on the ground. Um, you either have those because you read a lot of books and you drank a lot of sugar teas on the ground, or you don't have them. So what you can always do is you can always get a good understanding of what the internet has to offer. But from the, like, you can really get somebody like who's a um, humanitarian helper to become like this super expert on the Middle East. So there's all these different languages that we've talked about that are a bit of a problem. We have the problem that we do not speak all of them. By now, however, online translations are quite good and a quite good help to get closer. It's obviously additionally good to have people in the background that actually speak the language. We have our analysis that also speaks Arabic. That's like the first way of getting to the content. But the first translation draft online is actually quite good for research. So on your Twitter account, you can basically set all these different languages um, that are going to be taken into consideration when you're searching on Twitter. And if you want to gather lots of different information and diverse information, it's quite helpful to set this. Like having your own research account and only getting the information that you really want is quite helpful in this regard. And that you only follow the sources that are on the ground. There's different sources, obviously. There's there's um, institutions, there's, there's organizations and think tanks, there's private participants of private people who are former um, employees of humanitarian organizations or academics and stuff like that who actually have quite good information. You really have to, however, look at what is their interest in reporting and spreading information. Journalists are obviously always a good resource, um, news agencies, but also NGOs. But also with NGOs, you also have to look at what is their own personal interest in this. And then there's obviously a lot of different local sources that you can use. There's, again, private person, um, parties, militia, initiatives, and uh, functionaries. So with the problem with all of this is that there's a lot of fast sources, and they're obviously good sources, and for, especially for information that we usually wouldn't get, like the um, militia video that we looked at before. But on the other hand, we have the problem that with those sources, it's sometimes hard to really see, pinpoint where do they stand. So we have all this information and how do we handle this? So the first thing that we do is we map that. So obviously like every action of war is bad, but for us in particular, it's always extremely bad when it happens close to where we are located. So based, so I have my information, but then I don't know if the information is true. So there's this uh, letter that um, 
Trump sent to Erdogan, and I was convinced that this was a hoax. Um, unfortunately, it turned out to be true. So there was all this stuff that was like, don't be a tough guy, don't be a fool, I'll call you later. I was quite convinced that all of this was a clear rubbish and was like some sort of internet joke. But then I had to, like, and so then I Googled, I searched for the image, I um, did all sort of like quite uh, reputable sources that were uh, sharing this. So um, it was clear that this was the truth. So always like go based on two sources minimum. Um, watch out for them coming from different spectrums so that it's not two sources from the same uh, group of people but that is on the one hand the militia tweeting and then also a journalist who's tweeting it. So that's that increases probability of things to be factually true. So I always also have to ask myself where does the um, source get the information from? Um, is all of that one little source and they copied off of one another? Is this a source that's known? Do, does everyone know, believe the source? And then obviously also check with the other side of things. Raseline, we talked about that there was news that the the city was taken over but we had our team that was 30 kilometers south of that and there's like free field that's quite quickly crossed with a tank so we were obviously quite worried about our team but when we checked with the counter side of this um the um kurdish t um where were the kurds were were tweeting images and, and and videos from the area that was supposedly taken over so the interest of a source is also something that you need to look at when you look at a source. So there's obviously like they, they like to um, quickly um, produce words of success and like that ha they had a successful mission. So this is interesting like this leopard tank. Um, what do we know and what do we not know? The, the interesting thing about this one we know is that like not only do we know that the tanks are being used, they're being used by um, Islamic extremists, um, but also because Turkey has a contract with Germany and what does that contract with Germany actually say, is it allowed for Turkey to pass on those tanks to someone else? So there was a quite a few sources who were watching this specific thing. So there's Kurdish armies um, reporting that the tanks were being used by the militia and the Bild newspaper in Germany clearly smelled their their scandal, and they found a, the public speaker um, that said that of course we are being supplied um, with these tanks. So we looked at these uh, sources and like, and um, we kind of have the tendency to then take this as serious because this really fits our concept. You can uh, criticize government, but. Um, the dump, like the, the annoying thing about this situation was that both sides in this instance have an interest in this news to be released. So the one side to be quite cool, hey, we have all these tanks and the Kurds in order to um, um, basically uh, draw attention to uh, wrong, um, wrong ongoing and doing. Um, and so they wanted to frame themselves like the... The, so the the ones that were invading wanted to like frame themselves as like proper army with tanks. Um, however, <laughs> this from the same organization, somebody else said something like um, that is actually not true. Um, these images um, were um, taken completely out of concept uh, context and were part of the Turkish army and not part of the militia. Uh, riding uh, the offensive into the northeastern region. So it's really important to always l go on these three pillars and and you can like kind of that way you can get closer to the truth. Another thing we really don't want to forget is this image. It is very important for our organization. We don't we can't we don't have the time to talk a lot about like source analysis and how to do it right now. But uh, like one thing that is this happening is like everyone is over emotionalized. Not not only of of our people who are there, but also after five years, the whole region is like emotionally charged so much. So it's all very unsharp, unclear, and and so if we are analyzing sources, um, we have to keep that in mind. Also, you have to ask yourself: Is someone biased? And the w that's the one thing. And the other thing is that. 
if you are in the middle of a battle, or figuratively or really battle, then a lot of information is coming in. So it's very important to do a simple analysis. And if it's a, if you're in a stressful situation, you so you sometimes forget this to classify information. If information is coming coming in. I have to think about like, what information is safe, is safe information where I know the source and what is hearsay from, from an unknown source. So this should be obvious, but you quickly forget this if you don't, don't keep it in mind and you have to re remind yourself to really do this. And the last uh, item is uh, good for the nerds in the community here is OPS, OPSEC, Operational Security. security. Uh, here we is. This is something we don't have. We can we can only talk about this briefly. We can go can't go into deep. So a few years in Syria, there was the selfie of death. An IS unit took a selfie, put it into the internet, forgot to remove the geo data, and then a few hours later the rocket arrived. So these are also questions you have to deal with. He, in this short time, what we can do is. Uh, just like uh, talk about these t topics very briefly. We don't want to like spout big truths here. It's just about the question. We just want to put the question into the room here. So the next few days we will be present here at Congress, and we are very happy to hear I your input. But we are in the open infrastructure orbit, so visit our stand, and we would be very happy for your uh, input and to listen to you and your thoughts. And that's, that's it from us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Catastrophe and Communications on the Example of Rojava by Ruben Neugebauer and Sebastian Ginnemann. Uh, we have been Merle News and Daniel, and we had lots of fun translating this. Thank you so much for listening. Sebastian und äh, Ruben, Entschuldigung. <lacht> Wer Fragen hat, der kann bitte sich an die Mikrofone einreihen. Mein Signal Angel All right, hat so if you want to give us feedback, you can do so under the hashtag C3T. Um, so first question from the audience. Um, are, they, are there um, any sort of news on um, why they attacked ambulances um no there was uh, there was no official statement a lot of times it's quite logical who it was because um you can only these kind of these kind of attacks can only be done by drones um so this is quite easy to reconstruct and you can kind of pinpoint who it was but they will never admit to what they did so question number two how do civilians on the ground that are helping um, being brought there and, and how much help and what kind of help is needed? Well, the, the main ones that we need are quite s quite best, like specific, so like medical personnel clearly, like there is an existing medical healthcare system. Um, to go to a war zone clearly always sounds like an adventure, but it's it does take like quite a lot of time to prepare for this, and this decision to go there is is a tough one. And you always have to ask yourself: Are you adding, or are you actually um, just causing more trouble than adding value? Um, so, if you only have skills that are basically already there on the ground also you might have to reconsider whether or not you're right you can obviously also donate money that is uh, super important um, especially because the situation on the ground is quite complex and international organizations and UN money and um, money from the foreign ministry can be distributed there with quite large difficulties because you do not want to um, provoke the crazy person in the Bosporus. Um, it's quite difficult for us to um, get money, um, like official government money. So for Cardus, this is, this is quite hard, and we're like based on donations, and that's obviously also quite important. Again, like we will send um, medical personnel, doctors, and they have the experience to um, help with, together with the locals on the ground, to add value.
Okay, so then please give a warm hand of applause to um, Ruben, Fee and Zeb.